Live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, Season 12. Hi everyone and welcome back to The Dark Paranormal Season 12, Episode 2. And first and foremost, a huge thank you to everyone who reached out following our debut episode, The Black Key. It clearly resonated with quite a few of you as I received many stories of mainly terrifying music teachers from the past. Although sadly, none of them were paranormal, but some were still downright scary. And don't forget, if you'd like to contact the show with your true paranormal experience or for any other reason, you can contact us at thedarkparanormal at hotmail.com or visit our website, thedarkparanormal.com and click Contact Us. Submission-wise, we're completely full for Season 12, like I said last week, and there are some amazing experiences yet to come. However, this show is not going to end anytime soon. So please don't let the fact that this season is full dissuade you from sending in your experience. This is your show, and it's a safe space. Like I've said before, stories in the pub about a ghost dog returning to say hello are all well and good. But the person who's been dragged backwards through a kitchen window, they're probably not going to speak up in a pub. Because people like to believe in the paranormal if it suits them, if it's warm, if it's comforting, if it gives them belief in the afterlife. But the paranormal, as we know, doesn't always work like that. If the past 11 seasons have taught us anything, it's that some elements of the paranormal don't give a damn if you believe or not in the afterlife. And sometimes, like last week, you're just in their way and they want rid of you. Another lesson we've learned as we take this journey together is that some people, completely against their own will, seem to act as a paranormal magnet. Entities of all shapes and sizes seem drawn to them. And in today's case, although the entities vary, they all share a common denominator, an apparent malice. Why are some people attractors to these dark beings? And that's not rhetorical. Today's experiencer would genuinely like to know. But before we move on to today's true paranormal experience, we need to, of course, thank our wonderful team over at Patreon. When you sign up to Patreon, not only do you receive these episodes both ad-free and before everyone else, but you can also gain exclusive access to the Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites, which releases each and every Sunday, even on the downtime between seasons, meaning you never miss your paranormal fix. Plus, there are close to 50 hours' worth of paranormal experiences that have only been heard by our Patreons for you to binge through. We've built our wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over at Patreon, and we'd like to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal or click the link in the show notes. Like the following wonderful new members of our team have Mercedes Gorka, Eric Cobb, David Cav, Kevin Aronia, Nick Johnson, Erica Coleman, Christy, Courtney Richards, Addison Walker, Tommy Jones, Jesse, Keaton Dave, Leanne K. Reichert, Davis Dunn, Dawn Newman, Siobhan Lawrence, Caroline Herdenberger, Dathan Hawkins, Shannon Robinson, Jim Morphus Gass, Crystal Kirkland, Hannah Kelly, Aaron Joseph, Shasta Orley, Joanne Addis, Christina Bartrug, Megan Hannah, Kirsten Minchin, Paul Correo, Maggie Anderson, Shimina Dirks, Dina, Alice, Vivian Martinez, another email underscore 17, Jeffrey Sharp, Mary Harron, Alina, Christine Bennett, Chris Murray, Kat Green, Silves, Maribel, Becky Wade, Connie or Alexandra, Jocelyn, and finally, Emma McWaters. And we needed to get Emma in because her mother signed her up and we read her mother's name out last week. So sorry about that, Emma, and welcome to the team. And I hope you and all of our new team members enjoy all the early ad-free releases as well as those Dark Bites episodes to binge through. 
I've seen and been a member of many Patreon communities, and I genuinely believe we are building something special over there. So if you'd like to be part of that, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, it's that time. Lower the lights, make yourself comfortable, and of course, leave your disbelief at the door as we hear all about the Dark Attractor. By way of an introduction, my name is Amanda. I'm 46 years old and I live in Utah. I was born in Utah, but I was raised in northern New Mexico. And I've experienced the paranormal since before I can even remember. But I should say, I've never written any of this down before and I've shared these experiences with very few people. My mother told me that when I was a child, she would often find me standing in my crib, talking baby gibberish to someone, someone seemingly standing in the corner. Well, I cannot remember this, but I can remember the constant barrage of, well, beings that I began seeing nightly around the age of four. These instances were so terrifying that I still remember them in stark clarity over 40 years later. And I'm going to share my experiences in a loose chronology. There are too many of them for me to put down, so the following I'm about to share are the ones, to me anyway, that stand out the most. Before I begin, I do want to say that I had a very wholesome upbringing. My parents didn't expose us to anything scary, so I didn't have any fuel, so to speak, for nightmares or my visitations. What I saw was authentic, and something I'd never seen before until that moment. I was also not experiencing sleep paralysis. I've had sleep paralysis as an adult, and there is a marked difference in a visitation and a waking nightmare. I also want to say that my parents were never involved in the occult or anything obvious that would invite these things into our lives. That said, as contradictory as this sounds, I do know that my mother was often visited by a shadow man, and my father said... He could see spirits and would sometimes speak to them. So perhaps this is all generational. Who knows? The earliest memories of a visitation that I have are from when I was four years old. We lived in a small house in northern Mexico. I shared a bedroom with my two younger sisters. Our house only had two bedrooms, a bathroom, a living room and a kitchen and my bed was the farthest from the bedroom door and near two large windows. Well, I hated this, because I was so far from the safety of my mother, who was across the hallway, and I would see these beings almost every night. To describe them, they were about three feet in height, blacker than the night and they all had hoods covering their face. I remember going to bed and laying there in the darkness, straining my eyes to see if all was clear, and they would materialize out of the darkness. These beings would pace back and forth around the bed, only stopping to lift their hoods and gaze at me, with teacup-sized glowing red eyes, There were always around six or seven of them, so they basically surrounded my bed. They had bony black hands that would pull these hoods back, and I can still remember laying frozen in bed, watching them pace in front of the dim light that came through my bedroom window. I can remember how terrified I was to sleep at night, because when I would walk into my own bedroom... I could feel them waiting for me. Sometimes they would lean over me, or, to my horror, 
over one of my sleeping sisters. I would hold my breath whenever this happened. They never said or did anything. They just paced and watched. I would pretend that I was asleep, and I would watch them through my almost closed eyes. I never screamed or tried to get out of bed, simply because there were so many of them. It felt like they filled the room, and I was trapped. Thankfully, we moved when I was around six to an old mobile home up on a mesa. There were a few houses that surrounded us, but they were at least a mile in all directions. We had a running joke when we were older that my father was allergic to civilization, so we were always living in the boondocks. This mesa was no different. It was covered with juniper trees, sage bushes, and sandy washes in which we spent hours playing as little kids. We had no idea there were scorpions, rattlesnakes, and coyotes all over the area. We just wanted to play. At this point in my life, from a paranormal sense, I'd only seen the little beings from my old home. However, when we moved, far from being free of them, these interactions morphed to an entirely new level. I no longer saw the little men with the red eyes. I began seeing new beings. And along with the manifestations came horrific nightmares. I would have the same ones repeatedly, and my dreams were very vivid. So much so, I couldn't tell if I was awake or dreaming. The dreams I had were very different from your run-of-the-mill nightmare, and I could always tell the difference for two very obvious reasons. First, when I awoke from the nightmare, a shadow would always be standing at the side or the foot of my bed. As a side note, I always thought they were the ones giving me the bad dreams. Second, I was always in a conscious state in these dreams. I was very aware of my thoughts, my feelings, and I could not tell that I was dreaming. I will relate the two I had the most. Remember, I was only six or seven at the time, and the second one is deeply disturbing, so I do want to give a prior warning. In dream number one, I would be stood alone, under a single lamp in a dark room. I'd been standing in the kitchen spreading peanut butter on a piece of bread when the light went out. I peered into the darkness, and I started to hear whispers in the dark, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I stood very still, waiting for them to come out of the dark. I made sure no part of my body was out of the line of the light which surrounded me. And then, suddenly, my cousin came out of the dark and stood at the edge of the light. I remember that his eyes looked funny. They stared through me like he was in a trance. And he spoke to me. Mandy, come play with me. His voice sounded funny as well. Deadpan. Then he turned to leave, and as he did, I saw a creature clinging to his back, staring back at me with bright yellow eyes. I can only describe it looking like a gargoyle. Its skin was dark brown, leathery, covered with lighter brown warts. It had large eyes and ears and long, thin arms and legs, too long for its body. Then it slowly smiled at me, and I started to shake. It was only then that I would become aware of how many of these beings were in that dark room. I couldn't see them, but I could feel the essence of every one of them. It was almost like I could cast my mind into the darkness and find them. 
My shaking got worse as I could see some of these things moving towards the edge of the light. And they would all be whispering. Andy, come and play with me. As they passed by, I could feel their desire for me to step out of the light and join them. I would start screaming in the dream and this would finally wake me up. And now, dream number two, and as I said, this is quite disturbing. But I was lying on a cold stone, and when I opened my eyes, I can see a stone ceiling high above me. I realise that my body feels strange, and I can't move my arms or legs. I look down, and I see my feet are bound either side of the stone with a sort of rope and so are my arms. I am on a stone slab in the middle of a giant cave. It's lit with torches and there are people all around. It appears they're having a feast and drinking. They're very loud. They're almost Viking-looking in appearance. I realise that my body feels strange because I am not me. I'm an adult. I remember thinking I was big. I try to wiggle my hands and feet, but they won't move. My attention is then drawn to a very large chair. It's covered in furs and antlers. It sits high above the feasting people. The antlers seem to form a crown around the top of the chair, and there's a man sitting on the chair, just watching me. To my young eyes, I thought he was kind of pretty, but I was still terrified of him. He had jet black hair and very blue eyes. And now I would say that he was very handsome. He stands up and comes down from the chair, and the crowd goes crazy. I can hear the roar of the voices in my ears. I panic. I start to frantically try to get away, but of course I'm stuck. He stands at the foot of the slab, smiles at me. I'm thrashing around at this point. He comes towards me and starts to crawl up onto the slab. Then, suddenly, I'm above my body looking down at him. I don't know what he did to me, but I do know that I'm dead and that he did it. And I know I didn't want to die. I can still hear the people cheering when I wake up. This dream was always terrible. It was so real. And those are the two nightmares I remember having the most. And each time I would wake, there would be a figure stood next to my bed. Today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp, because sometimes in life we're faced with those tough choices. The path forward may seem obscured. Choices around your career, your relationships, or anything else. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming. And I'd just like to personally add, this is not your standard host-read script. I'm in therapy myself for these very reasons. And I'd like to say a few things now which may hit home. Firstly, I was never one for therapy. That was for other people. Secondly, we all have good and bad days, I thought. But then I noticed the bad days started outnumbering the good. And so I started therapy. And I'm so glad that I did because it's helped me learn positive coping skills. It's allowed me to set boundaries. And more importantly for me, It's pointing me in the direction of the person I want to be. So if even once you've thought, I wonder if I'd benefit from therapy, then you 100% should give it a try. And the perfect place for you to give yourself that try is BetterHelp. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist And you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Life doesn't come with road signs. So let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash darkparanormal today and get 10% off your first month. 
That's better help. H E L P dot com forward slash the dark paranormal. Let's take a quick break to talk about Drizzly. Now, gifting is hard. This isn't news, but what might be news is that you can now send beer, wine, and spirits right to your friends and family with Drizzly, the go to app for alcohol delivery, which is good news. Because adult beverages are the only gift that no one ever returns. And Drizzly's tailored experience lets you find the perfect drink for the occasion, no matter what that is. You'll save time by shopping a huge selection of drinks from wherever you are. You'll save money by comparing prices on said drinks across stores. And you'll get to spend more time sipping with your giftees. You know, if they're the sharing type. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D R I Z L Y.com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. With my new nightmares, I began to see new beings. One of the beings I would call the shovel headed shadow. The first time I saw him, I'd awoken from a bad dream in the middle of the night. I can't remember the dream, only that I opened my eyes and immediately felt something was in the house. I looked around the bedroom and could not see anything moving, but I was immediately on high alert. I knew something was coming, but the moment passed and nothing happened. And just as I let out a breath of relief, I saw movement at the end of the hallway. It was walking down towards my room. I couldn't see any defining features, only a blacker mass than the darkness of the hall. It was a moonlit night, because I remember how bright it looked through the windows. And when it got to the window in the hallway... I truly froze in terror. It was just over five feet tall and had a head that, to my young eyes, looked like one of my father's shovels in the shed. Looking back, I now think it was actually a monk with a deep cowl over its head and its hands crossed in front of it, buried in the sleeves so I couldn't see them. When it got to my door, it stopped, raised its head, and stared at me. By this time, I was sat up in bed, my back against the wall, squeezing my pillow to my body to shield me. I didn't utter a sound, and we stared at each other for a long time. It glided into my room and stood at my bedside. No sound at all. No footsteps as it moved across the floor. I vividly remember staring into the even blacker void of the hood. There was no face. No face that I could see, but I knew it was looking at me. Suddenly, it removed a hand from its sleeve and reached out to me. I looked down and it was a bony hand. It was almost at my leg... When I squeezed my eyes shut, I let out a blood-curdling scream, waiting for it to take hold of me. But the next thing I knew, my mother was standing at my bedside, trying to calm me down. The second being that I saw at this time, I only saw once. But once was enough. I had a habit of occasionally sleepwalking and we had a little stove in the living room, one that would heat the house in the winter. It was near the doorway of the hall, so you could feel the heat from it as you came into the room. One night, I found myself standing in the living room. No memory of how I got there. I woke up because I could feel the heat of the stove coming through my blue nightgown. It was dark, and I immediately became afraid because I knew something was there. Something was waiting for me. 
I quickly looked around the room, my eyes darting back and forth, and then my eyes found, for lack of a better description, a beast sitting on the couch. It was black, patches of hair sticking to it, huge dark eyes and a mouthful of sharp teeth. It had long, thin arms and long, thin legs, but was very fat, with pussels and warts all over its body. I stood there and started shaking. We regarded one another in silence. I kept trying to make my feet move, but I was terrified that if I moved, it would move. It would get off the couch and walk towards me. It suddenly moved, as if it was going to rise. But instead, it lifted an arm and made a gesturing motion to me, beckoning me to come to it. This break in dynamic gave me the courage I needed, and I bolted back to my bedroom, hiding under the covers, waiting for any sound of footsteps to follow me down the hall. I heard movement in the living room, but after a while, everything went quiet. The third being is what I called the Neon Man. One night, I was having a nightmare about a man with a hatchet trying to get to me through the wall. I awoke with a start and looked around the room. By this point, my mother had put a nightlight in my bedroom because I'd woke up so often screaming in the night, and I was terrified of the dark. Anyway, after looking around, I sighed with relief, because all I could see was the soft glow of the light covering my room. I rolled over, feeling much calmer, and my eyes went to the doorway. And there he was. He was standing there, watching me, glowing. He had an electric blue outline that emitted a glow like a neon light bulb and large glowing red eyes. The eyes were great red orbs, not surrounded by flesh, just literally looking like bloody eyeballs floating in invisible sockets. He was completely transparent, except for the light that seemed to outline him. Slowly, he walked into my bedroom and stood by my bed. I remember looking through him and seeing the lamp on the shelf. I thought I was dreaming because in my previous experience, bad guys were always afraid of the light. But he was standing in front of my lamp and I could see through him. I sat up in bed after realising I was not dreaming and I plastered myself to the wall. Once again, we stared at each other. I kept my eyes on his hands, which by now he'd brought up and placed on the edge of my bed. I felt like an insect being observed, and once again, all I could feel through my terror was a sense of wanting and hate. He lifted a hand and reached for me, I closed my eyes and screamed, and I only stopped screaming when I heard my mum say my name. Amanda, it's okay. It's okay, Amanda. The last being, or rather beings, usually came in a group, and I know that my siblings saw these people as well. They were human skeletons that would walk up and down the halls. They would come into the bedroom, bend over our beds... I'd watch them inspect my siblings. There was also a small one, about the size of maybe a four-year-old, that would run up and down the hall outside. My mother told me, many years later, that she thought we were out of bed, running up and down the hall by her bedroom, because the running would always stop at her bedroom door. I hated their visits because they seemed to last for hours. And the house would seem to vibrate when they came. That's the only way I can describe it. 
those were the nights I didn't scream, but instead I would lay there in silence, trying to be as small as I could in bed, always hoping that they would think I was asleep and go away. But I could still feel their eyeless gaze as I feigned sleep, I always felt like they knew I was not asleep. It never occurred to me to try and speak to them or tell them to go away. I was too terrified. It's odd to say, but I almost felt like I was linked to them when they would appear. And this feeling only grew keener as I aged. These instances were not just limited to my home. One time, we were visiting my grandparents in Salt Lake City, and I was around eight years old. The kids would all sleep on the family room floor, and she would leave the kitchen light on so that we could see, find our way to the bathroom during the night, etc. Well, one night I awoke, and there was a shadow stood over me. It was so tall that it had to bend its neck to fit in the living room. It had a hat on and a cape that looked shredded. I remember thinking that it almost looked like it was covered in black leaves. And he was straddling two of my sleeping siblings. I tried to scream, but I couldn't make my mouth move. He started swaying back and forth as he gazed down at me. Mummy! burst out of my mouth at a whisper, and then Mummy! Mummy! I said it louder and louder, and he vanished before my eyes as my mother once again came to the rescue. When we moved again, I stopped seeing these beings for a long while, although I still had terrible nightmares. I would often wake in the night and feel a presence in the room, but would see nothing in the blackness. By the time I was a teenager, my dreams had reached new levels of terror. I could still be awake in my nightmares. I dreamt of being experimented on, raped, murdered, tortured and even once I committed suicide in my dream. I awoke with my heart thundering in my ears and frantically touching my body to make sure I was alive, because I was convinced I'd just died. I was just a child when these nightmares happened. I think back on it now, and I'm horrified at what I saw in my dreams. Sometimes... I wonder if I saw memories of things that happened to other people. I don't know. But I do know that some of them are not appropriate for public consumption. They were beyond terrifying and felt unbelievably real. Into my teen years, I became very depressed and I started having anxiety issues. Around the age of 16... I had an experience that I will never forget. My parents had taken the family back to church because they decided we needed some sort of religion in our lives. We had a youth group that we would attend on a Wednesday evening and I would drive myself and my younger sister Candice to the activity. One evening, when we'd finished the activity, my sister and I headed out to our van to drive home. We got into the van and I went to put the key in the ignition when suddenly the air around the van seemed to get dense and dark. Suddenly I was filled with the most horrible feelings of death and despair. I literally wanted to cease to exist. All I could see was blackness. Even in my darkest hours since then, I've never felt despair like that. I would have begged someone to kill me, just to get the feeling to stop. It was like being plunged into the darkest pit and forgotten. It felt like my body was coming apart at a spiritual level. I've never felt 
anything like that before or after that experience. I became aware of my sister, and I heard her say, Can you feel that? I turned to her and said, Yes. We were both crying. We jumped out of the car and ran into the building. We encountered an older gentleman in the foyer and told him that there was something outside. I remember him gently taking us by the hands and heading outside. We made it halfway across the lot when he stopped, looked at the van, he paused and said, Yep, and turned around and took us back into the building. After some prayers, we felt safe enough to return home. As an adult, I stopped seeing things the same way. I knew the spirits were still there. I could feel them sometimes in the night, when I would get up for water or go to the bathroom. But I didn't see them. I never experienced knocking or objects moving like others have. I've just always been acutely aware of the spirit world. I've been touched, but it was not like other people's experiences. I was never scratched or bitten or physically attacked. But as I say, I have been touched in a terrifying way. The first time it happened, I was 19. I was laying in my bed on a hot summer night, only wearing a T-shirt and underwear and laying on top of my blankets. I'd been tossing and turning, trying to get comfortable in the heat. I finally rolled over and hit that place where your whole body relaxes. I closed my eyes and sighed. And then I felt it. Two fingertips, with firm pressure, touching my ankle. The touch was warm, not cold. They only lingered for a moment on my ankle and then moved slowly up my naked calf, across my knee, up my thigh, until it hit my T-shirt. It was like a caress, and it was intentional. There was no doubt it happened. I was frozen because I knew no one was there. I looked around quickly into my empty room and I got up and turned the lights on. No one. So I buried myself in my blankets. It took me forever to go to sleep that night. It was such an odd experience for me because I didn't have the usual warning or awareness that anyone was there like I usually did. It terrified me. The only other time I was touched was years later, as I knelt down to get something from my bed. A hand suddenly rested on my left shoulder. I felt the warmth of their fingers. Once more, I turned and no one was there. I didn't have any warning that time either. To date, I've not been touched again. We had to move back to Utah in my late teens, and I hadn't seen any of what I would term monsters in a long time. But now, I started seeing people. I began working with my mother in a bakery. I went to work around 4am, and one morning I got into my car, prepared to back out of the long driveway, and there was a single street lamp near my car, so the interior of the car was illuminated. I looked up into the rearview mirror and there was a man sitting in my back seat. I could see him as clear as anything. He had white hair and a long white beard. His eyes were a light bright green and they were staring right back at me in the mirror. And then I suddenly felt malice. And when that feeling hit me, he smiled. This interaction only lasted a few seconds, and I spun around and looked back, and nobody was there. A few days later, I was working, and I turned to see my mother coming out the back room. 
I asked her what was wrong, and she said that she'd just had the creepiest experience. She said she'd been washing her hands in the bathroom, and when she looked up to the mirror, she saw a man with a long white beard and bright green eyes staring back at her. I then told her about my experience of seeing the same man in the back seat of my car. As you can imagine, both of us were creeped out. Also, I was convinced that the bakery we worked in was haunted. Little things would happen. We would feel someone walk up behind us, and no one would be there. The bakery floor was cement, so people walking around was very pronounced. Once I was talking to a co-worker that was walking behind me, and I turned around to make a point, and nobody was there. I'd been talking with her and heard her footsteps behind me. One night, after everything was cleaned up, and I started walking towards the doors of the store to leave, I heard a huge crash, and I immediately became irritated because it sounded like the large cake pans had fallen off the drying rack, which meant I would have to stay and wash them all again, because I couldn't let the bakers use pans that had been on the floor, even if it was a clean floor. I marched to the back of the bakery to find out how big a mess I had to deal with, and when I arrived, everything was quiet and orderly, the pans were neatly stacked and drying on the racks, untouched. This incident didn't scare me. I'd worked a long shift and I was tired. I put my hands on my hips and I said loudly, I don't have time for your shit tonight. I'm going home. And I left the store. I dubbed it the hobo ghost because we joked only a hobo would haunt a grocery store. There were several other instances in that store that led others to believe it was haunted too. However, I won't include those in this narrative. There are other stories that I could include, like the night I woke up because I heard a deep growling sound. I had a lovely cocker spaniel named Coco, and she always slept on the end of my bed. She was the one growling. I reached over and turned on my light, just to find out what the matter was. And she was plastered to my quilt, and staring at the empty chair sitting across the room facing the foot of my bed. I called her name, but she didn't pay any attention to me, or stop growling. She didn't move her eyes from the chair. She made her way to the edge of the bed, growling. And then she dropped off the edge of the bed and in a complete change of behaviour, hid under the bed and started whimpering. Now, I couldn't see the person in the chair, but I could definitely feel their presence in the room. I told it to leave, and I waited as the minutes passed, and the dog continued to whimper under my bed. The room became thick and heavy, I stared at the empty chair too, waiting. And then suddenly the dog stopped crying, and I felt the presence leave. The room felt lighter, and the heaviness was gone. It was not the first nor the last time she would bark or growl at things I couldn't see. I'm going to go ahead and end this now. I don't want to send you a novel. My apologies if my story seems a bit disjointed. I've just had so many things happen, I've had to pick out and choose what I write down. I must also note that I've never studied the occult, or demonology, or even played with a Ouija board. I just know that I'm aware of the spirit realm, and they are aware of me. I don't think I'm a medium or anything of that sort. Why would I only be able to sense the evil ones? I would be interested in hearing people's feedback, if this makes it on the show. You see, I don't have answers. 
and there is part of me that would really like to know. I don't generally explore the paranormal, other than watching the odd ghost show on YouTube. It was odd for me to explore this podcast, but I was curious about the experiences that others have had, and I'm glad I did. It's been quite a journey for me to listen to those stories and to compare them to what I've experienced. Thank you for taking the time to read this. I am now a devoted listener, Amanda. Wow. Amanda, thank you so much for providing your true paranormal experiences for our episode 2 of season 12. And, like Amanda asks, let's throw this out to you guys, our wonderful community. Why do you think she seems to only attract dark entities? I certainly have no experience nor knowledge of why this could be. Especially, as Amanda states, there's been no dabbling with divination or anything along the lines of the occult. But maybe one of you guys do have a theory that fits. And if so, email us, thedarkparanormal at hotmail.com, or of course go to the website, thedarkparanormal.com, and hit contact us. If I had to take a guess, I would say maybe you also do see the nicer spirits. But because they're nice, because they blend in, you're kind of oblivious to them. In the same way, if I drive down a motorway, I couldn't tell you the number of cars I passed, but I could tell you the number of crashes that I passed. But that's just my theory in a multitude of others. And so that brings us to the end of Episode 2 of Season 12. For our Patreons, I will speak to you again on Sunday for yet another instalment of Dark Bites. And for everyone, I'll speak to you again, this time, next week, for Episode 3 of Season 12. And until then, remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll see you next time, right here on The Dark Paranormal.